Hi, welcome to talk about the new season here on Shaw TV North Island. Thanks for tuning in. And today we have a fish theme. Aquaculture Awareness Week is coming up in Campbell River and our guest is Dr. Jim Powell. He's CEO of the BC Centre for Aquatic Health Sciences. I almost got that right. <laughs> Jim, thanks for coming in. Thanks very much for having me. Now, you're uh, CEO since about April? May, yes. May, okay. And uh, I didn't know much about the Aquatic Sciences Health Centre until I went in and visited yesterday. I've got a few clippings, of course. But how long has it been around? Nine years. Wow. Um, and how many staff? We've got, currently got 12 staff, including temporaries and uh, some visiting scientists. Yeah. And who pays for it? It comes from a variety of sources. We do fee for services for work for the aquaculture industry. We do work for the uh, federal and provincial governments as well uh, for their overflow, overflow for diagnostic work. We do uh, research based of, from university collaborative work or with the government or with uh, other private entities as well. So there's a number of sources of revenue, but it's all centered around uh, ecosystem health, fish and health and welfare and um, really creating prosperity for the fisheries and aquaculture sectors. Yeah. Now, I went in yesterday uh, to the, uh, with my first visit. I was surprised how big it is. That's right. Yeah, it's about 7,700 square feet in the old OP building. And that's uh, 871 Island Highway? 871A. A, okay. You don't want to go to the dentist's office if you're yeah. looking for fish, yeah. And you can't wander in because it's uh, very... Uh, well, what's the word for it? It's a biosecure zone, so it has limited access to it. You have to be passed in, signed in, then uh, if, you're, if you've been to another fish farm or if you've been uh, out fishing or at the hatchery or something like that, we ask you to hang around a little bit and maybe dress up in a lab coat before you come into the lab. So yeah. we're truly trying to keep it uh, so that you don't bring in pathogens from the outside into the lab. Yeah. Well, um, I was amazed at the range of stuff you do. Uh, what do, you, what do you think are some of the most important? What do you spend the most time on? Oh, the most time on are the, are the stuff we really uh, like to sink our teeth into. Um, well, the, it's the time is PR, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doing things like this. No, it's, um, uh, we have three main areas. and One is diagnostic work, so that samples come in from a variety of sources again, and uh, we'll work on them to look at, see if, if fish pathogens are present or uh, whether they're parasitic or whether they're bacterial or viral, and we'll do detection of those. Uh, we do a series of researches on, on, on for projects of, of interest to, to fish and aquaculture, so uh, disease pathogens again, or uh, ecosystem health. We do, uh, that's, those research projects are, are one of our, our mainstays. And then we have longer longer-term research projects that are set up that are largely collaborative that will work with either yeah. private or public enterprises to looking yeah. at um, prevalence of disease, uh, epidemiology, uh, where these pathogens are going, what are the trends, what is the impacts on ecosystem health or fisheries and aquaculture. Yeah, a lot of stuff. But apparently you focus on finfish, but you don't do like uh, shellfish. No, we're not, uh, we're not shellfish oriented. Uh, we've got a backbone and... Uh, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> not, a, not at a slight to our, our good friends down at VIU and the uh, Center for uh, Shellfish Research, which uh, they, they take over that end That's of things. That's near Qualicum, I think north of Qualicum. There, there's one in Deep Bay and yeah. then there's one at VIU. Uh, Nanaimo. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the finfish thing, uh, Yesterday, you were telling me about testing the brood stock of uh, Atlantic salmon. Correct. What, what's, what was going on there? Well, uh, this is the spawning season for Atlantic salmon, as it is for Pacific salmon. And each of the brood stock that are taken for eggs for the next year's progeny, whether they be remain as brood stock or go into production, have to be tested for an, a number of pathogens. So as a third party that's independent of, of the producers, we will look at those tissue samples that come in and test them for those, those reportable and non-reportable yeah. pathogens on behalf of yeah. the uh, aquaculture producers. Yeah. 
And I think you said each hen is worth $8,000? They're worth a lot of money because, of course, the Atlantic salmon carry between 10 and, and uh, 12,000 eggs per uh -huh. fish. Is how's, what kind of a Pacific salmon do they carry? It depends on the type of, of Pacific salmon yeah. that you're looking It's really uh, about 1,000 eggs per kilo is really what it comes down to. Huh. So uh, what are you testing for? Uh, all of the reportable diseases and some that, that are not. So there's bacterial kidney disease. We do virology for IHN, for VSH, depending on, on the level of, of screening that's and required. And of course, everybody listening knows what IHN is. Well, I think they should know what IHN is. It's been very prevalent in the news. That used to be called sockeye salmon disease. I IHN, infectious hepatonecrosis. Huh. It's, a, it's a disease of the liver. Causes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a virus yeah. that causes disease in the liver. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, viewers, I'm sure, will know that aquaculture has been a contentious issue. Uh, salmon farming, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, Alexander Morton and, and such. Uh, there's a concern about diseases coming from the East Coast to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Yesterday you're saying that hasn't happened. Not to date, no. No, it hasn't. The, the Rockies seem to be the divide, and, it's, and for a number of pathogens, too. There's, there's sets of, of protocols that must be met with the Internal Transplants Committee and CFIA to move any fish or any product of fish across, really essentially across yeah. the Rockies, but even across the border as well. Yeah. Has, the, I was going to say your center, but we'll call it the center, had some uh, success in contributing to that? Well, certainly there's a group of laboratories, the provincial and federal, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Pacific Biological Station, and others. We're all linked together in the same effort to look at and detect the pathogens that are, that are transmissible in, in salmonids yeah. and other fishes, yeah. Yeah, so one of your jobs in a way then is to keep the coast safe. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, fisheries and aquaculture has such a huge impact for the coastal communities and the First Nations people. We, there's an obligation there to protect that resource. Yeah. Now, you're located in Campbell River. Why are you not in Victoria? Uh, Campbell River is where it's at. I mean, our, our mandate as as a nonprofit society is to serve the interest of coastal communities. This is where the action is. This is the yeah. southern capital of the world. Yeah. So that's why we're here. Yeah. Uh, his office has a great view. It looks out over fish boats. <laughs> how appropriate. It's wonderful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, how much of the work is focused on aquaculture and uh, uh, natural, I guess, or wild? Wild, wild. yeah. Uh, John, they're so interlinked as a science, there's really no division between yeah. wild and aquaculture, especially in our view. Yeah. Uh, we're there to look at what, what we can detect and how we can pass that on. We're there for information and for knowledge base, really. Yeah. I'm fascinated by the sea lice story. Sea lice is a very interesting topic. I mean, um, uh, we've known about sea lice since the, the 80s. And it used to be that if, if you caught a fish in the river and it had sea lice in it, it was what a great fisherman I am because that fish hasn't been in the river for so long and it's fresh from the ocean, etc. And then it sort of turned around and said, people said, well, it's, it's, killing, it's killing our fish. What about this? Oh, it's coming from the salmon farms. There's a transfer of lice. And you know, when you sat down and think of it, it didn't make a lot of sense that fish that didn't have any lice in it going into an environment they're catching it from somewhere. Where is that catching it? Yeah. So that's how the story got, got rolling. Well, but sea lice has been here for how many million years? It's co I don't know, but it's co-evolved well, with salmon all the way along. Yeah. yeah. It's called the salmon louse, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, uh, the slice testing. Right. Th uh, tell us about that. Enamectin uh, benzoate is a, a, com a compound that's approved for use in salmon aquaculture for use to keep the lice counts down. Uh, there's a really um, good base of understanding knowing that certainly we don't want a pool of lice in, in one population that may spread to another. So how do you control that? How do you mitigate that risk? And part of that is by the, the, the farms do lice counts on their fish on a very regular basis that are reportable yeah. and that they keep in, a, in, a, in the database. And uh, when li louse levels get up to a certain point, they're allowed to use an oral anti-parasite. And it's the same sort of one that's used in sheep or, or your dog or your cat sort of thing to get rid of worms, yeah. anti-parasite. And uh, the concern is that if that is used repeatedly that there will be a built-up resistance in the lice towards that treatment. And nobody wants that. Yeah. So 
what we do on behalf of, of um, producers and, and of the, the companies that supply this is, is test the lice that come off of fish at harvest and during checking yeah. whether or not those lice are EMB, which M means benzo and enamectin benzoate resistant. Right. So we do a logarithmic scale of, of yeah. concentrations above and below what the therapeutic index is for that drug yeah. and test it on actual lice samples that have been collected yeah. off of wild fish and off of fish that are out of net, yeah. net cages and we report that back. Now yesterday when I was visiting and of course when this views that was maybe a while ago but uh, you showed me this uh, TV screen, a, a, a computer monitor <laughs> worth $180,000? Uh, maybe more now. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> and a, a, that was testing for lice DNA? Uh, well, we can, we can amplify it. That's called a quantitative uh, uh, Easy for you polymerase <laughs> change reaction Yeah, <laughs> machine that, um, that finds minute sources of DNA and amplifies that to the point where we can find out how much is there. Yeah. And how does that relate to uh, lice resistance to slice? It, it doesn't. That's oh, okay. um, different thing. Real, that, those are two different tests. One's a bioassay and one's, one's a presence absence how much. Yeah. Um, let's jump back to your training and your mm -hmm. work experience. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> well, I, I came out of Simon Fraser University out of, out of the uh, biological sciences and took a job there that summer uh, working as a fish culture technician. Huh. And uh, I worked there on studies that had to do with uh, tolerance of fish species to acid rain inputs. If you can remember back then it was Hat Creek was going to be burning coal, so BC Hydro sponsored a, huh. a series of experiments. Acid and so rain. I'd be, yeah, <laughs> well it would be devastating on our coast with the, the non-buffered yeah. waters. So you don't hear about it anymore? No, it's fallen off the radar, yeah. It's yeah. more global warming aspect anyway, of it. Sorry, I yeah, interrupted. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, and SMFU. then I really, I really liked it and uh, that rolled into um, Masters of Science. So I worked on smolt physiology. The smolt is the seawater migratory phase of, of salmon in, in coho and I looked at their physiology and their ability to adapt to seawater. Um, that, well at the time the government jobs were pretty thin so I went and took a job on a mom and pop salmon farm um, working with, uh, for free pro bono on a homestead uh, up on Nelson Island in the Seashelt and wow. started out as a grunt. As we grew, I became head grunt. And then as we went public, I became uh, the director grunt. And then it was sold to the Norwegians? Um, no, that particular one wasn't. Uh, okay. I got transferred over to Tofino and I put in five sites in the Tofino area oh. uh, 25 years ago and four of those are still <laughs> operational to this day. Yeah. And I worked here in the Campbell River area with uh, Joint Ventures. Th that got tedious and tiresome and hard. Um, so after the birth of, of our, my daughter we, in Tofino, we moved over to Demon Island and I took up a research position with, with EWAS, the feed company, huh. doing feed research. And uh, that was super, but that really whetted my appetite again for uh, research. You got a PhD somewhere in there. Well, that's where the, the once I started liking research again, I went back to uh, University of Victoria and did a PhD in uh, molecular endocrinology of reproduction in fishes. Easy for you to say. I, I got that one out. <laughs> and um, so we worked on reproductive uh, control, neuroendocrine control, the brain hormones that control reproduction. Yeah. And did a postdoc with uh, um, Dr. Steve Cross. He's now at NIC. Uh, but we had a, a firm out in Sydney called um, Aquametrics Research. And there we worked on a variety of, of aquaculture uh, interactions with the environment, benthic fouling underneath, uh, siting, coastal zone management. Uh, benthic fouling, what's that in English? Poop under pens. Okay. And uh, looked at siting criteria for currents, for plankton, et cetera. But in the meantime, I had a postdoc, an industrial postdoc, with, uh, to develop spawning mechanisms for uh, species in captivity. And out of that came a product that I got scooped up by the pharmaceutical yeah, company. You got a patent I saw on your yes, CV. Yes, I do have a patent, yeah. And, uh, and that grew into a product. And so the pharmaceutical company took me up and I spent 10 years with uh, Sindel Laboratories traveling the world, huh. working in different spheres of aquaculture, I think in 14 different countries from Southeast Asia to Iceland and Norway, etc. 
in the south, the, this, the world capital of aquaculture, I was thinking, oh, it's got to be uh, Norway, but it's actually China. It's Beijing, yeah. <laughs> it is. And uh, I spent some time there, and uh, all through Southeast Asia, uh, growing fish for food to feed people. Wow. and looking at uh, sustainable methods for that and how, how yeah. products could fit in to help farmers produce more and, and better and safely. Because uh, especially in those areas of the world, they can be quite rampant with their use of, of drugs and yeah. misuse of it. What pulled you to Campbell River? Well, I, a, after uh, there was an American takeover of the company and uh, I decided that I was going to go work for the public entity and I worked for Freshwater Fisheries Society of British Columbia, huh. again aquaculture centric. Uh, producing recreational fish, but also conservation aquaculture. And I did about half and half between uh, conservation. So I, I was chair of the Upper Columbia White Sturgeon Recovery Initiative, looking at uh, wow. white sturgeon on the Columbia Rivers and in the Chaco Rivers, and uh, working with uh, groups in all around on, on endangered fish and uh, culture methods to help bring them along and, and work in conservation methods. So that lasted until uh, the past CEO, Sonia, decided that uh, four or five years was enough, she was going to move on, and uh, that came up. I'm a founding board member of CAUSE, and uh, Cause. Uh, Center for Aquatic Health Sciences, okay. and I didn't want to pass that opportunity up, and I thought, I, I think I got something to contribute, so yeah. we went ahead, and that's why I decided to take that. Well, it's been roughly six months, how are you finding it? I'm busy. <laughs> it's very interesting. It has a lot of challenges and it has a yeah. lot of fun. The, the people at the lab are absolutely terrific. I don't think you'll find it. a group of people that are as dedicated and as fun as, as that yeah. group. They're really terrific. Yeah. I, I think we mentioned that you got 12 staff, but what's the annual budget? At uh, 1.2. 1 1.2 million. Well, that's not a lot. Uh, it's a nonprofit, so we're not in there for the money. We're in there for the love of it. Huh. So you could make more money elsewhere doing other things. Oh, sure, of course. Yeah. But it, when you, you look back and you go, what did I do? You yeah. don't want to say I just made money. Yeah. You want to say yeah, I made yeah. a difference. Yeah. OK, I can imagine the viewers asking all sorts of questions. Uh, but this one, I think, is really top of mind. Uh, we got a headline here, uh, Laura. Record pink salmon run at 1.4 million. And then I've got a. Uh, Jeremy Maynard column here about uh, the Taiyi Club, the lowest qualifying catch for the club since 2003. So we've got record pink and very few Chinook. Why? There are co two completely different species that have completely different life cycles in the ocean environment. Um, let me talk a little bit about one of the projects that we've got going that the outgoing Dave Ewart from the Quinsome Hatchery has started. And, yeah. I, and I think this will help answer, answer, yeah. answer your question. We started looking at the timing of release. Dave was releasing fish at coho salmon three different times in the spring. Uh -huh. We looked at the center uh, pro bono, looked at what was going on in the receiving environment. What were the plankton counts, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton counts? What groceries were there for fish to survive on? Okay. Phyto Once and zoo, what's the difference? Phyto is, is the plant planktonic life. Okay. Zoo is the animal planktonic life. Do young salmon eat plants? Depends on the size of the fish. A really small fish will graze on algae, yes. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's where most of those good fish oils come okay. from. Is, is so, that sorry, I interrupted. That's okay. So we looked at the productivity of the receiving environment versus the time of release based on the coated wire tag in their nose that came back years afterwards. Huh. And it was striking to find out that when the groceries were there and the release was there, a fish of, of, a, of an optimal size survived better and came back better. Well, it's so not surprising, it, but it's, you proved it. I mean, yeah. it seems common sense, but unless yeah. you can really show it, yeah. you're not going to change anybody's mind on it. Yeah. So they dropped that April release and went with the other later May releases and released a larger fish. So in doing that, it had greater ability to adapt to seawater life, but hung around in the estuary and grazed on the proper stuff that was there and came back in greater numbers every year after that because of, yeah. of timed releases. So it's your fault that we've got a record pink salmon? Right? So the pink salmon, in a good year, when water temperature are right and the phytoplankton's there for them to feed on, yeah. yes, they do really, really well. Huh. So um, when they go, and they only come, they come back after a couple of years, it's a smaller fish. So their life cycle turns around a lot earlier. Yeah. As well, 
Uh, the Chinook salmon, they can stay anywhere up to five years in the Yukon in fresh water before they migrate to the sea. They, they go on, on their schedule. But around here it would be two or three years. Correct. They would be in, in fresh water over one winter yeah. or over two winters. Yeah. It, de it depends. Yeah. So the, and then they stay out there for four to five years, okay? So they're, they're out there for quite a long time. Yeah. So you can imagine the results of coming back from a good year of, of hitting seawater are going to mean more fish come back in for the yeah. pinks, but not necessarily so for the Chinooks. Yeah. There are way more conditions that are out there because those Chinook migrate out to the Bering Sea gyre and they feed out there. So there's a host the of... The gyre um, is a circular water. It, it's, a, it's water that just moves around in the Gulf of Alaska yeah. and has a nice big plastic ball in the middle of it now. Yeah. So, um, He's being facetious. Uh, no, it's true. It's there. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, but I mean, it's not nice. It's no, it's not nice. It's nets and ropes and floats and stuff yeah. from the tsunami and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, yeah. so the the fish are feeding in that area, so they're staying there and they're growing in the bigger, and then they're migrating a longer distance back. So you can see that they're exposed to more environmental pressure and predation pressure, and yeah. of course, human pressure. I'm a big fan of salmon ranching, like Alaska does, uh, and one of the issues is the species you use. So if you, if you raise a species, and they've done this at Quinsum to mm -hmm. some degree, where you have to keep them in fresh water for two or three years, mm -hmm. the cost of feeding those and managing those mm -hmm. is prohibitive, really. Can be, yes. But if you raise a pink, mm -hmm. you keep it for a few months, let it go, and it comes back. John, there are more pink and chum salmon going into the Pacific Ocean than there ever were before. Yeah. Nobody has looked at what the impacts of that are. Uh, Alaska is not the only person that's, that are, uh, are people that are putting fish into there. The yeah. Russians are pumping in like crazy, the Japanese and the Chinese yeah. now. Well, that's one of the questions if we had the time I hoped I could get to, and I'm glad I can. Um, is there much danger of the aquaculture or the farmed or the, uh, uh, the what's the hatchery raised, uh, backing out the wild? It already has. Yeah. There's, there's, well, when you talk about ranching, that's, a, that's an aquaculture hatchery fish. Yeah. And um, most of those that are going into the, the northern Pacific now are hatchery raised fish. And so they're competing for feed with the wild. Correct. And is, is, there, is there signs of a shortage of feed out there? That's up for debate. Yeah. A DFO are the better people to talk to about that. They have their fingers yeah. on, on that, that pulse. You've never been in politics, but you're, you're pretty smart politically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, let's see what... Oh, yeah. Uh, the sites and the volumes of the fish farms. Mm -hmm. uh, I gather from talking to the uh, BC Salmon Farmers Association people who've got Aquaculture Awareness Week coming up. Uh, when this runs, it might be this week. But... Uh, they're saying that they can't move their sites, I think, uh, or they have trouble getting them able to be moved, and they can't enlarge them. So really, um, the industry is capped. I is that kind of a correct assessment? And I'm well, putting words in their mouth, which I may take back later. If let, I let's look at it from a global perspective, and um, from what I've seen in, in the other salmon-producing nations of Scotland, of uh, Ireland, very little, uh, Norway, etc., yeah. and Chile. I sp spent a lot of time uh, there. They all have similar regulations where the carrying capacity of the environment is set to some model, yeah. and uh, that gives you a level of production in terms of tonnage. In some cases, the number of feed, how much feed you can use, or how much, how many fish you can hold. So those caps, that's it's pretty typical. But what's not typical is is uh, access to new sites. Uh -huh. And once you once you prove it, that process is quite slow here because it's such a contentious issue. Yeah. Would the industry be better if it could have move its sites from time to time? That model has shown uh, much prospect and promise in in other areas where yeah. you uh, all in all out fallow and move around. Yeah, I, I gather like some of the early aquaculture farm fish sites on the west coast here. You know, they put them in bays where there was no circulation, and then mm -hmm. they were third-party observers were surprised when there was buildups under the pens. Uh, <laughs> so maybe are we getting smarter at where we put these? Well, it's not just that. Let's look at the infrastructure that's developed throughout the industry. Uh, okay. I can remember taking boom logs and cutting holes in them and nailing four by fours to them. That's not going to stand up in open, open weather. 
Yeah. So the cage technology has really changed that. The type of net that's used has, has changed yeah. considerably. We don't get seals breaking in as much now. Feeding system and feeding systems as well have much improved. You don't waste any feed yeah. anymore. That's that's just money down the yeah. tube. So yeah. you you have cameras, etc. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's changed a lot. So yes, yeah, so they can go to better sites, sites that are more adaptable and and yeah. can handle production. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I've got lots of questions here, like the virus study, but before time runs out, um, is there something, message that you want to pass along? Well, we want to grow our business, certainly, and uh, that business is to do with coastal zone uh, prosperity and fisheries and aquaculture. The center itself, we want to expand our capacity, not, not just so that we can help out with uh, First Nations fisheries, with the wild fisheries and with, with aquaculture and government and surveillance of diseases, but also we want to create jobs here that are highly qualified personnel for people of Campbell River. I was at a conference where a young man was uh, presenting the genome of the Northern Pike. In a large international conference, people came from everywhere to talk Atlantic salmon and genome uh, expression in fish. And I said to him afterwards, I got talking and I said, when are you coming home? He said, what are you talking about? I said, you're from Campbell River. Yeah. Here's a, an international scientist, I said, a graduate student, I said, when are you coming home? And he said, uh, I'd love to. Huh. Is there a job for him? Not yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there a funding issue? There's always a funding issue. Nonprofits uh, survive on, on, on services, that, that's true, but also on, on donations. So if you know um, some elderly people with a hockey sock full of money that want to uh, do some good in the community. Or young people. <laughs> or a high tech whiz. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and where do they reach you? Is there a website? We do. It's uh, cahs uh, bcca Okay. Uh, and now I've got time for a little thing. Can you do this? Uh, local researchers contribute to virus study, August 13th, Mirror. Yes, that's the uh, Piscine Rio virus study, and that, uh, we're very proud to, to play a role in that, which was absolutely collaborative between industry, between the, the, the federal and provincial governments. Uh, we looked at the, the prevalence of, uh, it's called PRV, and it's a heart virus. Huh. And uh, there was some speculation that, and accusation that it was linked to a, another disease called HMSI, which was heart muscle skeletal inflammation. And that's been a problem in, in Norway. So the link there was that y you brought it in. You, you Atlantic salmon people brought yeah. this in. That's so the allegation. That's the allegation. So we were able to show definitively that that virus existed prior to the introduction of, of Atlantic salmon through right. archive samples that from huh. the ministry well, well using done. that qPCR machine that you, you saw there That's and, great. and histopathology. <laughs> okay. Well, my guest has been Dr. Jim Powell, I guess I should say our guest. Thank you, Shaw TV North Island, for doing this. If you'd like to, and the volunteers, uh, if you'd like to watch this, we're on YouTube too, so you can uh, pick up some of those fancy names that Jim was f floating out there. Um, yes, so thanks for watching Talk About. Uh, we're back for a new season. Tell a friend.